Welcome to the show, everybody. My name is Mark Barzetta. This is the Farzi Show presented by MyBookie, MyBookie.ag. Lovely to have you along for the ride. Howie and Nick speak yesterday, for the most part, said nothing. They said nothing. They, uh, three card Monty. They talked about that to open the press conference. Howie Roseman didn't know if they were live or not. That was hilarious. Uh, if you saw the picture in the thumbnail of the show today on YouTube, that was them talking about full card Monty. And I've never seen them happier. I've never seen them happier. Uh, <laughs> the draft, we got nothing. Lane Johnson's a great player. Could they draft a backup for Lane Johnson, a replacement for Lane Johnson? They could. Could they not? They could not. 34 minutes. And the only thing we got out of yesterday was uh, full card, uh, three card Monty. <laughs> I almost called it full card Monty. That's uh, in the nude. Anyway, uh, that. And how he didn't want to be questioned about a sound writing. <laughs> he did not want to be questioned. And at Dave Uram, I have known literally, literally since his first day walking into WIP, where he walked into my office and I, 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 I gave him a gig as an intern. Yeah. Because I was, as a promotions director, I was in charge of the, as a job I would never do again. Oh my God. I don't have many regrets in life, but being a promotions director, that's certainly one of them. Um, but, uh, yeah, Dave, you, well, Dave walks in, hands me like a stack of resumes. I was like, you only need one resume. He's like, I, I just feel like I should give you more. Anyway, uh, so Dave asked the question yesterday about Hassan Reddick, and the question is more or less, why would you do that? <laughs> that was more or less the question. Why would you, for a third, a guy, four straight seasons, double-digit sacks, two straight seasons for you, played with one hand for three games? Why would you do that? That was basically the question. Uh, and how he didn't like it. He didn't like it one bit. Uh, well, so we'll get in that conversation. That was really the only definitive thing we got from Howie Roseman yesterday. <clears throat> um, he was asked about the, the history of not having success, success, or really the history of not drafting corners in the first round and finding other areas. But that's all stuff that we knew. Didn't He didn't really reveal anything when it came to um, uh, what was you know, what, the, what the Eagles could be doing in this upcoming draft. Um, did seem to normalize the idea of drafting somebody's replacement a year or two earlier maybe a year earlier, like Cam Jurgens, for instance. Um, so we will, we'll, we'll break it all down. Uh, it is play-in day in the NBA for the Philadelphia 76ers. The Philadelphia 76ers take on the Miami Heat tonight at 7 o'clock. I can't wait for that game. I am itching for that game. And I, although I am confident that the 76ers are going to win that game, it's playoff Jimmy, baby. And yes, I know it's the hottest team in the NBA. The Sixers are uh, hitting a stride, and uh, they they played the Heat four times this season. They split uh, the, those games two two, and Joel Embiid missed three of them. Um, I got confidence the Sixers will beat the Heat, I, but it's one of those things. Where, like they, this is the one game that I really, one thing I really expect them to do. It's like one of the things that I'm probably most willing to look past and say, oh, well, they got this, and they're going to take on the Knicks in the first round of the playoffs, right? That That's how I feel about it, but being that confident, it's weird. Again, it's it's that reverse, I don't know what to call it. It's the oxymoron. It's the, because I have not had confidence in the Sixers getting out of the second round, uh, I have never felt more confident that the Sixers will get out of the second round. I guess because my expectations are so low, I have them so high. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense, but I feel like the last eight years as a Sixers fan has really melted my brain into just finding confidence. Um, but I have extreme confidence they're going to win tonight. It's a cluster you-know-what. It's a mind that you, well, you know what I mean. Anyway, uh, so we'll get to that conversation then. And, of course, Ranger Suarez tosses a complete game for the Philadelphia Phillies last night. And if you watch that game... First off, it was over by like 8.50. That, that's just one thing that just jumped out to me. Like, wow, hold on. Because I went to do the post-game show. I was like, damn, this is early. I could maybe watch the final episode of Curb with my wife after the game. This is going to be amazing. Well, after I do the post-game show, of course, uh, which we did. Well, she got tired and we only watched like 20 minutes of it anyway. So anyway, uh, Ranger Suarez was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And I, I, I regret using the word gem so often when talking about Aaron Nola going seven and a third the previous start. I regret it because, I mean, it's more than a gem to toss a complete game shutout. I mean, you're talking about something that only uh, Ranger Suarez has done once 
in his career, and it happened three years ago, September 21st. Uh, was it September 21st? September 25th? Whatever it was. Um, 2021 against the Pittsburgh Pirates. And in that game, he didn't even walk anybody. So come on, Ranger. What the hell was with yesterday? I'm walking somebody. Uh, yeah, September 25th, 2021 against Pittsburgh Pirates. Um, and Ranger went out there last night and it just was masterful. I think of the fourth or fifth inning, fifth inning, fifth inning. I, I did a, I didn't take a gander at the pitch, pitch count. You know what I mean? And uh, I'm like, oh my God, fifth inning. And he's only at like 42, 43 pitches. Wow. Okay. That's pretty incredible. And then I went back through the game and I looked at his uh, strikeouts in particular. First strikeout of the game, second battery face, Tavar. Three pitches, got him on a curveball. Go down the game a little bit more in the third inning, faces Tolia. Three pitches, got him on the curveball. Another three pitch strikeout. Later in the game, four pitch strikeout. <clears throat> he was just absolutely efficient. In that start. And yeah, of course, wildly accurate, but wildly efficient. The curveball that it, it finishes at a guy's shoelaces just looks like a meatball. You know what it looks like? If you're a batter, you see that thing come in so high, you go, oh, pff, that's a hanger. Oh, man, I'm going to I'm gonna put that 420 feet out into the outfield. Oh, that ball's leaving the stadium, baby. And then it just dies and it breaks at an ungodly speed down and out of the strike zone. And you're like, oh, ah, ah, flailed all over the place. For the people on the podcast, I just did an amazing pantomime of uh, flailing at Ranger Suarez's curveball. Uh, and that's what guys were doing last night. It was absolutely amazing to watch Ranger Suarez last night. Now, started the ninth inning at 93 pitches. And um, right around that mark, you know, that any manager in modern baseball is going to think to themselves, all right, when do I got to get him out of there? I'm not just going to go tinker topper on this, okay? He's not going to tinker too early. But any manager is like, eh, do I need to do this, dude? Do I need to do this? So Bryce Harper steps up to the plate in the bottom of the eighth inning and blasts a two-run home. Well, it was 381 feet. He hits a home run uh, to right field, two-run home run. After Rangers or after um, Johan Rojas got on base, and at that point, you got some wiggle room. Instead of it being a three-two game, you're seeing a three-nothing game. Uh, it's a um, five-nothing game. So you got a couple more. You got room. You can give up a grand slam and still bring in the bullpen and close out the game. Cross your fingers. So Harper hits the home run, makes it a five-nothing game, and. Topper is like, uh, yeah, go out there. I think he was going to send him out there anyway. But when Rangers started struggling a little bit <laughs> in that ninth inning <clears throat> and uh, some guys got on base, you're sweating it out a little bit where eh, maybe the complete game shutout isn't going to happen. But Rob Thompson gave him the leeway. He ended up facing six batters. There should be five batters in that. Uh, and he got out of it. And is there any better way? Uh, well, first off, you let off with a single with Charlie Blackman on a four-pitch at bat. Then he got Tavar to strike out on a six-pitch at bat. So already you're at about 102. Uh, and then another four-pitch at bat ends in a single to McMahon. So now you got two runners on. Then he strikes out Diaz. Seven pitches in that at bat. And then there was no better way to there was no better way to end it. A two-pitch at bat to Jones that ended with Ranger Suarez fielding the baseball. And Recording the out. And then everyone gets excited on a complete game shutout. And that's exactly what you got from Ranger Suarez yesterday. Uh, and and I give credit. I give credit to Rob Thompson for not pulling Ranger Suarez after he gave up that second single to McMahon. And if Harper doesn't hit that home run, maybe he pulls him after the leadoff single by Charlie Blackman. Maybe that's where he pulls him. Certainly pulls him after the single to McMahon. Uh, but Topper said, you know what? Go ahead out there and do your thing, son. And you know what Ranger Suarez did? He went out there and he did his thing. And he finished it off and he used 112 pitches in total throughout the night to record his second career complete game shutout. Seven hits surrendered, 
one <clears throat> excuse me one walk uh and struck out eight in the game uh curveball was beautiful fastball was dead on accurate he used his cutter yesterday at the knees just cutting guys off the knees with that cutter uh used that a couple of different times but his main put away pitch was the curveball and it was just a thing of beauty yesterday very much in control very efficient and Ranger Suarez is being every bit of Ranger Suarez that we hoped he could be. And the Phillies' uh, starting rotation is one of the best in baseball ERA-wise. That's pretty spectacular. I uh, got spent. Uh, excuse me. You got Christopher Sanchez on the hill tonight. Uh, so hopefully he keeps that going. Even in his last start, he struggled a little bit. Struggled in particular in the field. But uh, it looks like uh, he could be crossing his fingers for a little bit of a bounce back. Uh, the start uh, for the Phillies not terrible. His last outing again. His more more problems for him were. Four, we're done by him in the field. So hopefully we'll just recover from that today. <clears throat> 6.05 start time, by the way. Let's not forget that. Other than Ranger and the way he pitched, the way he fielded was great. And then the help he got in the field was also great. Uh, you had Alec Boehm at third base making some plays for him. And Brandon Marsh, his throw from left field on Montero ended up being in Sports Center's top 10, it was the number three play. If you didn't see this play by Brandon Marsh, you got to find this play and look it up. I wish it could play for you, but MLB would shut me down if I did. In the eighth inning of yesterday's, excuse me, seventh inning of yesterday's game, uh, <clears throat> there's two outs in the inning. Rockies are desperate to get anything going. And what ended up happening was Montero laces one to left field off the wall. They, the communication must have been off the charts yesterday. They must have been screaming to Brandon Marsh, two, 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 two. He fields it, bare hands it off the wall, turns, fires to Bryson Stott at second base. Bryson Stott doesn't even have to move his mitt. If you're having a catch as a kid, it's like, all right, don't make me move my mitt, right? And you're throwing the ball. Don't make me move my mitt. Good throw. Yeah. Bryson Stott, second base, down in the position to catch the ball. Does he have to move his bit right out of the air? Tags Montero. Montero looks up like, what happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? I love when the runner is just so shocked that he's just, how did that, how did that happen? An act of God happened, son. Sit your ass on the bench. You're out. And Brandon Marsh threw a laser, a frozen rope, as Charlie Manuel used to say, a hose report. You know what I mean? And he threw a hose, absolute hose, a frozen rope. To get Monte, it, you have to see it. If you haven't seen it, you have to see it. <clears throat> uh, he was fantastic. Uh, Brandon Martian left. Uh, Yohan Roas ran on a couple in center field. Uh, Bryce Harper uh, had a great leaping catch in the early goings of the game, and then Alec Bohm at left field uh, in uh, third base was was great. Was absolutely good. So the defense was there to back him up. And then how about this? Uh, There's a funny thing that happened. Um, you have a, a one, two, three, first inning which he did, uh, Ranger Suarez. And then in the bottom of the first inning, run support. What? Yeah. Run support. Where the, your team scores for you so you don't feel like you have to do everything right. Either way, he did everything right. JT Romuto stepped up to the plate in the bottom of that first inning. Uh, Trey Turner reached on an error. Bryce Harper struck out, two outs in the inning. Real Muto goes up there, and he belts a two-run home run to left center field, uh, 413 feet. Hanging curveball. Hanging knuckle curve from Gomber. Just hung up there and just uh, JT Real Muto, the Sicilian that he is, saw that hanging meatball and went, eh, manja. And then, boom, ball was gone. Two nothing. Beautiful. Uh, then you go into the sixth inning. Uh, Bryce Harper got his first of what be three RBIs on the night. Beautiful to see that. Trey Turner got a single. Trey Turner, excuse me, a double. Trey Turner's just been great. I always preach patience when it comes to Trey Turner. I think he's such a better hitter when he is deep in account. And what does he end up doing? He takes the first three pitches all out of the strike zone. Then he takes the fourth pitch, strike. All right, he saw it. And then the fifth pitch at the at-bat, he lines down the left field line for a double, so he's standing on second base. Bryce Harper steps up. He gets a double. You get back-to-back -back doubles. He worked an eight-pitch at-bat, by the way, where he fouled off four pitches, and then he got that fastball. He sat on it, and then he just roped it into uh, left field. And there was an RBI double there. It's a 3-0 ball game. Gomber then goes out. Vodnik comes in, right-handed pitcher to get Bohm. He got Bohm. Uh, Painted the corner with a fastball, and boom, 
had no answer for it. And then the Phillies rolled after that. It's absolutely fantastic. Phillies are two games over 500 for the first time this season, uh, and they have won yet another series. You have to go back to the Cardinals, no, Reds, Reds, excuse me, Red. I got my red team uh, messed up there. Uh, the Reds series to go back to the last time the Phillies lost the series. So there's that. That's a good vibe. That's a good vibe. As I mentioned, Christopher Sanchez gets the start. Uh, it was great. It was absolutely great. It was a fun game to watch. That game moved along, and I never did actually check the official game time of the game yesterday but uh let's see turner two for four harper two for four with the three ribbies uh real muto with the two run homer that's all great that's wonderful it's beautiful it's lovely and then game time wise again you want to talk about efficiency how long was this game i don't even really two hours two hours and seven minutes I ain't mad at it, folks. I ain't mad at it. I ain't mad at it at all. Uh, so great, great Phillies game last night. I have to jump into the Eagles right now. Uh, there were two press conferences yesterday. One, I learned that God is on our side. That's my second God reference of the day, but God is on our side. Devontae Smith addressed the media, and he had shades of Reggie White, but in a in a good way in this press conference. Uh, and then Nick Sirianni and Howie Roseman addressed the media. They talked about all the off-season moves. They talked about keeping the core together. They talked about losing veteran leadership like uh, Jason Kelsey and Fletcher Cox. And then down the line, soon you're missing Brandon Graham. And then a little further down the line, missing Lane Johnson. They talked about the draft. And they gave nothing. They gave nothing. Again, three-card Monty is what we got. <laughs> How do you not know you're live? Anyway, um, that was the press conference. That's pretty much what they talked about. I'm going to start with uh, Nick and Howie. Got nothing from Nick. Uh, and I don't mean that to continue an offseason of what is it you say you do here with Nick Sirianni. I just, you didn't get much from Nick. Um, what you got from Howie was only on Hassan Reddick. Only on Hassan Reddick. So here's Howie when he was asked the initial question about the deal in general and how that deal came to be. And are you going to miss a guy like Hassan Reddick being around the Philadelphia Eagles? Here's what Howie Roseman had to great say. Great player. You know, Hassan had a great two years in Philadelphia, obviously. You know, Camden kid, um, played at Temple. Couldn't have been more excited to sign him. So it's bittersweet um, to lose a player and a person like that, um, you know, as the offseason went along and uh, we we added uh, Bryce, who we're incredibly excited about, brought back Josh, trapped to Nolan Smith in the first round. BG came back. We have some young guys at that position who we're excited to develop, um, you know, and, and through the conversations with the Jets, um, we felt like, uh, it was a win-win situation, but always hard to get rid of uh, players and people like Hassan. Yeah, uh, I, I'm sure it is. Loves Hassan. Everyone loves Hassan. Hassan's great. I, I, I still theorize, and, and Sills has asked me about this a number of times, but I, 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 I agree with him that this doesn't seem like a Howie Roseman move. I, I know you have. Like, have we gotten the, the announcement yet that Hassan Reddick has signed an extension with the New York Jets? No, we have not. We've got the announcement that the, the Jets have uh, have changed their uniform a little bit, so we've gotten that. But we haven't gotten any contract extension with Hassan Reddick. So right now, Hassan Reddick is going to play for the Jets under the same amount of money that he could play for for the Eagles, and the Eagles still have cap space. So it's not like the Eagles couldn't afford it for one more year. So the only thing that makes sense is uh, either Vic Fangio just said, ah, I can't. I'm not going to be able to use this guy. He doesn't want to drop back in coverage. I'm going to be dropping him back in coverage. The, uh, let's let's make a move here. The only thing that goes against that is that Howie Roseman, and why I don't think it's the most the uh, why, why I don't think it was Howie's call more than anything, was that it would make it would make sense just to keep him. What do you mean you're not going to drop him back in coverage, or you're going to drop him back in coverage too much? He's well, then use him for what he does great, which is to get after the quarterback, maybe. Maybe coach to what you have a little bit there, Vic Fangio. Maybe instead of a square peg round holding everything, maybe you're like, oh, this is what the, I have this guy on my team and I can, he's really good at getting after the, maybe I'll have him get after the quarterback. 
maybe I'll, I don't know, with at least one guy be aggressive. Or, you know what, if I'm not going to blitz a lot, but when I do blitz, I want one guy to be able to win a one-on-one -on -one battle. That's going to be a sound reddick. Kind of makes a little bit of sense, doesn't it? Anyway, uh, apparently not. So the thing that makes me think it was Vic Fangio's call more so than it was Howie was is the fact that Hassan's not here. I think Howie wanted him here. The only other plausible option is that uh, Hassan Reddick wanted that new deal, was only going to play on the new deal, and Howie was going to say, all right, we're not giving you a new deal, but what we will do is trade you to somebody that might give you that new deal down the line, and then if you end up staying here, we're going to restructure your deal. Where yeah, we'll give you a new one, but we're going to kick some guaranteed money to the back of that contract, or we're going to kick some of that annual salary to the back end of that contract. In essence, cutting the fifteen million he would have earned in the upcoming season, maybe down to eight, nine. And it's not just no, man. I want to play for the full money. I want to get that $15 million this year. And now he's like, all right, well, I got a buddy named Joe Douglas in New York. I can trade you up there. Um, no matter how you slice it, I just think it's stupid. I don't like it. I don't like it at all, especially since you didn't get the deal done with uh, the Jets. And then the Jets quickly announced afterwards, by the way, a new deal for Hassan Reddick, uh, $25 million in guaranteed money, $30 million in guaranteed money, and it's a, a, a two-year deal, three-year deal, whatever the case might be. No, that, that still has yet to happen. So that has yet to happen. This won't make any sense to me, and it'll just be doing what I just did, which was grasping straws to try to make sense of this. So the question got asked yesterday by Dave Uram of KYW News Radio. And Dave basically, oh, I'll let you hear the question and the answer. I even left in the media members trying to jump over each other to try to ask a question next, just so you have the full context of this and how this went down. Here's Howie yesterday on the follow-up question to Hassan Reddick not being here and the conditional pick that comes back to the Eagles for Hassan Reddick. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go around. I'm, I'm trying to be orderly. To follow up on, on Hassan, you referred to it as bittersweet and a win-win. What, what do you think the upside is for trading Hassan for the conditional pick? couple of years down the line well the pick's not conditional we're getting a pick so i don't really think i understand the question it's a third round that become a second round pick mm -hmm. right so what do you think the upside is for trading hassan with the, with the year left in his deal in his prime for the pick that you've got? well i think you're asking a question in a vacuum without all the other factors so i mean if we want to talk about all the factors that go into building the team and uh, the resources that we put into each position we can do that but i don't think the question's really fair and accurately describes the the transaction Look at the position that, well, <laughs> All right. Two sides. I've been in the shoes of a reporter asking a question that you think is reasonable and uh, makes sense and is legit. It's a legit question that people have. And then you know the subject does not appreciate the question. And they go back to you and you're like, oh, we're doing this really? Like, it's not that hard. Like, what is the upside to having a conditional third pick, a third round pick that could possibly uh, fourth to third, third to two? Uh, what's the upside of having that conditional pick? If you're Howie and you think it's a disrespectful question, if you're Howie and you don't like the question, oh, it, it, with a draft pick, you could take a great player. That's how you would answer it. If you're Howie, so that's the URM side of it. The the Howie side of it um, is you just asked me, why would I trade Hassan Reddick? What's the upside to trading him? Well, we get back a, a, another, we get back a pick. Where Howie, I think, really messed up was saying, it's not conditional, we're getting a pick. Well, th thanks. Obviously, you didn't just say, here, Jets, you're getting something in return. You didn't cut Hassan Reddick. If you if you say, what's the upside of cutting Hassan Reddick? Well, that's one thing, but that didn't happen. But the upside of trading a player that you know could get double-digit sacks for you on a consistent basis and will fight for you, what's the upside there? How are you better now is more or less the question. So you asked a general. So from Howie's perspective, you're being asked, why would you do that? <laughs> like, what, what the hell were you thinking? Howie takes that question as, what the hell were you thinking? In trading Hassan Reddick for a pick. I got, if you're supposed to be all in, if you're spending all this money now and you had more money left over to keep a player that only helps you be more all in, 
Why not do that? Why would you not do that? What's the matter with you? That's how Howie took the question. I get it from both sides, but it's a legit question. The easiest, the easiest answer out there for Howie Roseman is, well, we traded a good, we traded a really good player for a good pick. We we, we want to, you know, we want to have as many picks as possible because we can do a lot with those picks. So that's why that's the upside. And then people are talking about why would you ask that question as opposed to why did Howie answer it like that? Why did Howie play? Why did he get all coy and sheepish on the? Well, it's not conditional. We get a pick. Well, no one said he didn't. Oh, it's so annoying. Oh, it's so annoying. Uh, and it's not like how he didn't answer the question about Hassan Reddick. I just played for you. He answered the question about Hassan Reddick. He talked about a bitter, bittersweet win-win. Um, but it was a follow-up because I don't think anyone feels like you got decent value for Hassan Reddick. And I think everyone would rather Hassan Reddick be here in Philadelphia. So after I watched the press conference, thought about this a little bit yesterday, you know where I ended up? And if you watch this show, if you listen to this show, if you follow the show, you probably know where I ended up. I ended up right back in the spot that I was at when the trade happened and when the really going back to when they announced or when the story came out that the Eagles had given permission to Hassan Reddick to seek a trade. What I went back to was Hassan Reddick standing at his locker the same week A.J. Brown finally broke his silence and addressed the media and Hassan Reddick was talking about how the higher-ups made a decision to move on from Sean Desai. And how he was being asked about, uh, from Jeff McClain, all the confusion on defense with guys not knowing when to sub in and sub out and who they were subbing in for when they did sub. And all the confusion going on on the defensive side of the football. And Hassan Reddick being like, uh, you know what I'm saying? Damn. Uh, and then, finally, the, um, the nail in the coffin could have very well been Hassan Reddick being asked about, hey, you were dropped back and covered seven times. Uh, what, uh, what was, uh, what, did, what was, what was that about? And the sound Reddick going, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> snickering at the idea of a coach who just came in to replace another coach, dropping him back and covered seven times in a game. Not ideal. Not ideal. So I go back to some of this being punitive. Hey, yeah, well, we're not going to give you a new deal. So go ahead and seek a trade. And then the deal got done with the Jets and still no announcement on that new deal. I, I, I really don't know how to look at this other than it, this is uh, partially punitive um, against the San Reddick. I wish him well in New York. I wish him well in New York. Other than that, how he entertained the idea of when he was asked about weighing replacements, like using a first round pick, i.e. in this case, an offensive lineman. Uh, for essentially a guy that you're going to draft and then not play for a year or two. How do you go into this draft at 22 and, and weigh the pros and cons of a guy that is going to sit on your bench for a while uh, versus a guy that's going to come in as a first-round pick should and be a starter? And how we went down the avenue that we kind of already knew, which is they're not afraid to take a guy that's going to be stashed on the bench or – not going to be number one on the depth chart at his position for a little bit. And the the point that he brought up was Cam Jurgens. Cam Jurgens is going to be a guy that sat behind um, um, Isaac Sayamalu, sat behind Landon Dickerson, sat behind, of course, Jason Kelsey, and then got an opportunity to start at the right guard spot and did that last year and played very well. Um, not at a Pro Bowl level, played very well. He got to learn from Jason Kelsey. And one of the things Howie Roseman said that's very powerful is that they didn't draft Cam Jurgens after Kelsey retired and then say, oh, wow, you should have been here for uh, Jason Kelsey. You should have watched Jason Kelsey. I wish you would have gotten the opportunity to see how Jason Kelsey went about his work ethic. Or Jordan Davis, uh, you should have seen how Fletcher Cox went about his business every day. Uh, Jalen Carter, you should have seen how Fletcher Cox went about his business every day. No, he didn't do that. Don't, doesn't have to do that because they saw them. Jordan Davis, Jalen Carter, they saw Fletcher Cox. Cam Jurgens, Tyler Steen, they saw Jason Kelsey. So if anything, that only makes me believe more in the idea that I've already been leaning on, and that's that the idea that the Eagles are going to take an offensive lineman with that 22 overall pick asset, whether they trade up, whatever, um, they're going to take an offensive lineman in the first round. That's my line of thinking. When he was asked about cornerback, 
and drafting a cornerback. Yeah, they did explore other areas uh, of how they've acquired their corners uh, in recent history with Howie Roseman, really the last 20-some years here, because we're talking about Lito Shepard being the last first-round pick the Eagles uh, used to take a corner. So if anything, if I had to say I'm leaning one way or another, if this press conference pushed me one way or another, it pushed me more in the direction of the Eagles taking an off in the draft. Um, on a more positive note, on a more happy-go-lucky note, if you will, uh, Devontae Smith addressed the media yesterday. Uh, Devontae Smith talked about his new three-year, $75 million deal, plus picking up the fifth-year fifth option on his team. I didn't realize he's going to be 31 when this contract's over. So there's that. Uh, but you have uh, Devontae Smith addressing the media yesterday, and he was asked about why uh, why this deal now. And here's what he had to say. Um, I mean, th this is what God wanted. Um, you know, it was presented before me and, um, you know, thought about it, prayed on it, and, you know, that's that's what God put on my heart, so I followed along with it. Was was this on your mind at all during the season, or did you do a good job in, in your in your mind of kind of compartmentalizing and not worrying about it? No, nah, I wasn't worried about it at all. Um, you know, I just went out there and did what I was supposed to do. Um, I know everything else is going to handle itself. What does God? This is what God put in his heart, folks. Reggie White left Philadelphia and he went to Green Bay. That's God told him to. Yeah, all right, so God told him to. So we got God on our side in Philadelphia. That is a good thing, and you rarely ever can say that. And we got that. So this is great. How he signed God. Of all the acquisitions he's made in the offseason, we got God now. Howie, great job. Uh, number two, the core is very important. And I know a lot of people might go to, oh, you got to share the ball. These guys have shared the ball remarkably well. Remarkably well. And especially when you talk about wide receivers that can always go, oh, I, I, I got to get the ball. Keyshawn, John, ah, give me the damn ball. You know, For whatever reason, somehow, magically, the Eagles got this great mixture of A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith uh, seemingly being very much simpatico when it came when it comes to who gets touches. Uh, and one thing I'll give Nick Sirianni, Nick Sirianni a lot of credit for, you talk about the first game of the season two years ago against the Detroit Lions when the, season, when the Eagles were starting their Super Bowl season, uh, going to the Super Bowl there. Uh, you remember that game? Devontae Smith got nothing. A.J. Brown got everything in that game. Devontae Smith got nothing. The next week, he bounced back. He, he got his touches. He got his looks. He got his opportunities. So these guys are going to run very balanced in this offense. You're talking about back-to-back years, thousand our receivers, both of them. That's pretty damn good. So both guys are going to eat. So then later in the press conference, uh, Smitty was asked about what it means to him to not just be here with the Philadelphia Eagles, until he's 31 years old at least, but also playing with A.J. Brown for at least another three seasons. Yeah, the two of you, one, two, and everything. Uh, it means a lot, um, especially being drafted here and, you know, being able to play many more years um, alongside A.J., um, who I've grown very close to. Um, it means a lot to be able to go out there knowing that, you know, guys who have similar stories, guys who have the same, you know, passion, the um, – the dedication that we had to this game, it means a lot to just go out here and be able to continue to do it alongside of him and everyone else that's in this building. Simpatico. I, one thing that has been so true for me throughout this entire offseason and every move, and I know we've really been trying to turn the page on how last season ended and how terrible last season ended and how awful it was, but to this point, and you still got the draft coming up. You hope Howie hits that home run in the draft. Now, will an offensive lineman be a home run? No, it won't be a home run. It won't make. Oh, they really got it now. No, that's that's not that's not going to be there. I think the only thing that's going to make people go, "Hey, go Howie," is uh, drafting uh, uh, Edrin Cooper. And these are just these are, these are day two picks. These are day two picks. Uh, you can talk about. Cooper DeJean, you could talk about Kool-Aid McKinstry. Um, you could talk about guys that you have a little bit more flash than an offensive lineman. The offensive lineman is kind of the boring pick, but I think in Philly we kind of understand that that's how the, the Eagles have maintained a decent level of success, right, is making sure they concentrate on having that offensive line have depth. And you don't have the, the Jack Driscoll type to go anywhere 
on an offensive line. You brought in Matt Hennessy, so that's good. You got some depth there, but uh, there's a lot of holes on that depth chart. So although it wouldn't be flashy, it would be a necessity. But I think you look at the quarterback position, you look at the linebacker position, you have guys that you know you could draft that you could bring in and be immediate impact players. And if this is the all-in season, well, then I would love for the Eagles to do that. But outside of Cooper DeJean, outside of Kool-Aid McKinstry, outside of Edron Cooper, outside of Jeremiah Trotter Jr., there's some guys that Chop Robinson, I'll put in there as another edge rusher. You have guys like that that the Eagles could absolutely target and bring in here that would make you excited. But Philadelphia Eagles select, fill in the blank, offensive lineman out of that's not going to be. Yeah, that's not going to have that moment. It's not going to have that moment. Uh, but it, it, it that doesn't mean it's not a necessity for down the line, and that's not to mean that it wouldn't surprise us if the Eagles did. I still think my prediction is they go offensive line. I, I I really do love the quick interactions with people I have around the draft. Like I was, I got my cousin just bought a house and I went there for the first time over the weekend, and I I picked stopped picked up a bottle of wine, and a guy goes looks at me and he goes the, the guy behind the counter and he goes uh quarterback. And I'm like, me? No, I was a safety at Archbishop Wood freshman year, but thank you. Uh, no, 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 the Eagles. I'm like, I know. Uh, but uh, quarter, you go quarter of first round? And I go, I wouldn't mind it. Would love to see it. But my prediction does not match my desire. My prediction is offensive lineman. My desire is corner. Oh, man. I hate to disappoint somebody, but I got to be real. I got to be real, man. And the wine was fantastic. They opened it up. They insisted that we share. I do. You know, it's a house gift. How do I say no to that? I'm in their house. Anyway. Uh, so, yeah. With a good pick in the NFL draft, this season will be in the only go and retire to be in the dark recesses of my mind whenever the Eagles have a late season collapse and I'll be thinking about it. Even if the Eagles have a good season, I'll be thinking, I'll just don't don't have that collapse as you had. Oh, God, at the end of 2023. Oh, please don't. That's where we'll be. That's where we'll be. Uh, yeah. Hey, the 76ers have a game tonight, folks. It's a game against the Miami Heat. And it's a game that I am cautiously optimistic about. I, I put it like this. I, I just have such a great feeling that the Eagle, the Sixers could beat the Knicks in the first round of the NBA playoffs. And then, unfortunately, go and face the Celtics. Womp, womp. That I'm, I'm in a way, looking past this game against the Heat. I, I really want this game to be controlled by the Sixers from start to finish because any run by the Heat is going to – it's going to get to me. And it's going to make me feel like this Sixers team is going to be bound um, for some kind of – well, bound for playing the Celtics in the first round of the playoffs. Because they got the what Bulls and Raptors as the other play-in game. And then they have, obviously, the Sixers as a 7 o'clock play-in game tonight in the Eastern Conference. Whatever helps you not play the Celtics in the first round, I think, is what everyone's on the same page. Uh, everyone's on the same page with. Uh, uh, Hawks, excuse me. I think I said uh, Bulls, uh, Hawks. Anyway, that's what you're looking at. Jimmy Butler missed some time this season. Didn't see the Sixers in one of those matchups. I just, I don't see this Sixers team. And and Scary Terry not playing is a wonderful thing because I still have flashbacks to that series where Ben Simmons scored one point in one of those games against the Celtics. And Scary Terry, just that's where he became Scary Terry, just knocking down threes. And you're like, who the hell's Terry Rozier? What the hell? Where did this guy come from? Supposed to be scared of Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown. And instead, I'm scared of Terry Rogier. What? Um, yeah, Sixers and uh, Heat, 7 o'clock. And then 9.30, Bulls and, and Hawks, not uh, not Raptors, excuse me. Uh, but that's where we're at. I, I just, I have a hard time believing that as good as Bam Adebayo is, I just think Joel Embiid is going to get his in this game. I think Kelly Oubre is going to get his. I think Tyrese Max is going to get his. I just think 
The Sixers have the perfect top three, even if you include Tobias Harris with the way he's been playing lately, top four unit going out there on the floor. Having the experience of a guy like Kyle Lowry is something that you can look at as a little bit of an X factor. And then the depth coming off this bench. And the one thing we don't talk well uh, enough about is Nick Nurse. And I listened to Nick Nurse yesterday addressing the media, talking about matchups and talking about countering their counter and how playing Eric Spolstra is, is the closest thing you can get to a NBA chess match because Spolster is just such a great coach and a great strategist. And you're also talking about a team that did nothing but make adjustments last year. Like people forget, they had playoff Jimmy and all, great. But playoff Jimmy lost their first game of the play-in tournament last year and then came back and then they went on their ride to the postseason, or excuse me, to the NBA Finals, to be more specific, which is unbelievable. But one of the X factors here, I think the two main X factors are the experience of Kyrie, uh, Kyle Lowry and – the experience of Nick Nurse and the, the, the strategy of Nick Nurse. And that's something the, the, the Sixers have missed over, well, forever. <laughs> He's like, I was a Brett Brown fan and wanted to see him, you know, get this team over the hump and he deserved it and it didn't happen. The quadruple doink, of course, didn't happen. And then Doc Rivers, Doc Rivers did. And is now doing that with the the Bucks. So I just feel like you have right now a head coach that is able to make the adjustment to the adjustment. And for people that like talking about, especially this comes up a lot in the world of baseball, when you talk about the gut feeling, you get away from the analytics, go with the gut feeling. Nick Nurse, I think he just has that gut feeling. He knows when to ride with that gut. I, I feel like Ricky Council can help us here. Ricky, get in there. I just feel like this could be a good spark for us. Ricky, get in there. Like that's something that not every coach has where he's willing to trust a younger guy like that or an experienced guy like that, and he does. And basically must-win games that you had going out through the season to end the season, you found ways to win those games. And not every one of those games you had Joel Embiid up and running and ready to go. As much of a boost as it might have been for Tyrese Maxey or Kelly Oubre or those guys to go, oh, well, we have Joel, Joel back, and even if he's not playing this game, we, still, we, we know we have him, and he's healthy. So if we have him healthy, if we just take care of business in games that we got to take care of business, like Joel Embiid saying to Tyrese Maxey before the, the Spurs game, hey, I'm out tonight, man, so it's all you. Let's go. I got This team's got to ride you, man. And he drops 52? Yeah, I think that lets you know as a team, all right, we might not have him right now, but we have him healthy, which means we have an opportunity to do something special in the playoffs. Um. That confidence obviously helps, but on top of that, it's a coach knowing what buttons to push and when to push them. And you can talk about experience on the court with Kyle Lowry, and it's great, but when it comes to a head coach that actually knows what the hell he's doing, Nick Nurse, go out there and be that difference. That's one of the things that I, I, I'm really looking forward to about Sixers winning this game, Sixers going on, beating the Knicks in the first round of the playoffs. And the Knicks are a good team. I'm not just saying the Knicks are terrible, push them aside, but I just think the Sixers are the second best team in the Eastern Conference when Joel Embiid is healthy. And then go face the Celtics. And then Nick Nurse be the difference. Be the difference in a team that hasn't made it out of that second round since today's Allen Iverson. And that's what I look forward to. Let me tell you about my bookie, mybookie.ag. Oh, and of course, make sure if you haven't done it already, like, subscribe to the uh, Locked On Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel. I'll be on right after the Sixers game tonight to break it all down. We'll talk about bringing on Jalen Brunson. Bring on Josh Hart. Bring on those uh, Villanova fellas. Eh? Dante Deep and Chen, so. Please. Um, and let Kyle Lowry just put him over his knee and spank him. There you go. That's all I'm asking. Anyway, let me tell you about my bookie, mybookie.ag. Take advantage of all they have to offer at mybookie.ag. And right now, you can download the app, create an account, use promo code FARZY, and get up to $1,000 redeemable uh, cash bonus on my bookie, mybookie.ag. How about the amazing people at the Game Time app? Download the Game Time app to your phone, create an account, use promo code FARZY, get $20 off your first purchase. On the Game Time app, getting tickets has never been easier or more efficient than they are on the Game Time app. 
You want to view the seat before you buy it? See your vantage point? Go ahead. You can do that on Game Time app. You want to get all in pricing? That's what they give you on the Game Time app. So there's no wildly inconvenient convenience fee when you go to check out where those $40 tickets all of them go to $60. What? No, no, not on the Game Time app. Game Time app is fantastic. And how about this? The Game Time guarantee. Let's not forget this. If you find tickets in the same section or row for less money on another site or app, oh, Game Time. We'll credit you at 110% of the difference. How about that? That's the Game Time app, ladies and gentlemen. That's a Game Time guarantee. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use promo code FARS, you get $20 off your first purchase. How about PHL Sports Station? Philadelphia Sports Station, enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience across all social media and blogs. That's phlsportsstation.com. And finally, how about Sky Motor Cars? Check out all the amazing inventory at skymotorcars.com. Talk to my man, Brett. Tell him FARS, he sent you. Let's get into the chat check and see how you wonderful people are doing on this fine Wednesday morning. Daniel, what's going on? IBH, Sean Kilrain, good morning. Larry Anderson said on the radio, Ranger, 89 pitches. We'll see him to end the game. So it was end, it was 89 pitches at the start, not 91. My apologies. Thank you. 89 pitches, Sean. I, I understand what... Baseball is becoming. You guys have heard me say this before. I'm a non-practicing baseball traditionalist, so I embrace the DH in the National League now. I embrace the pitch clock. I embrace the runner on second in the in extra innings. You know, because this is the point. This is the argument I make. This is the point that baseball has allowed itself to evolve to. Four and a half hour games, dude. Three and a half hour, four hour game, dude. What are we doing? And we're worried about pitchers throwing their arms out? Good God, man. Um, this is the point that we're at. And Ranger getting 89 pitches. Like, it, it, I'm trying to, I don't know how many no-hitters there were last year. But I feel like complete games now, complete game shutouts are, are, are the new no-hitters. Like, that's what I feel like they are. Uh, Sean Curran, starting pitching has been fantastic. Phillies have the lowest ERA of any starting staff in the National League, 269. Nice. Uh, yeah, that's fantastic. James Alexander, what's going on? Good morning. Complete game shutout. I buy it. Now the Phillies have their rhythm. Uh, now, Bryce Harper hit a home run. Bryce, Bryce Harper hit a double. Trey Turner had a double. Uh, Bryson Stott had a hit, and it wasn't a cue shot. It wasn't a Diane Quayle. He had a legit liner to left center field for a base hit. That was nice. Uh, but the, the Real Muto hit another home run. Uh, dare I say it? Is it hitting season? I hope so. Uh, Philly Clipper. What's up? Wow. Great. Great avatar. Great profile pick. Whatever. Uh, the famous... Um, Chris Farley as John Crook on Saturday Night Live. Kevin Neal into Chris Farley, John Crook. Uh, shouldn't you be in Toronto? <coughs> Damn it. Ah, oh, I knew I was forgetting something. Great bit. Great bit. Uh, gotta love it. The game was Ice Cold Ranger. Uh, look good. Uh, look good with his pitches. Uh, so I was thinking about this, and I, I promised I'll never do a, a nickname show. I'll never do it. But I'm just going to say this: with the way Ranger Suarez was pitching and the way he was fielding, and really, it's the way he always fields. But like, forget about Ranger Suarez. More like Ranger Suave. Yeah, I'll show myself out. Okay, um, Buddy Christ. I knew danger, Buddy Christ. Why? Uh, thank you for telling Devonte Smith to stay here in Philadelphia. Thank you, Buddy Christ. Uh, I knew Ranger was special when he was asked to close out the NLCS and didn't think twice. Been that he's been my guy ever since. It's a great point. Ranger, you take the ball. Yeah, I'll take the ball. <laughs> whatever. Yeah, I talk about that whatever mentality. Bryce Harper has that whatever mentality. You want to go play first base? Yeah, whatever. JT Romuto has that whatever mentality. You want to go play first base too? Yeah, whatever. You've never played before. Yeah, whatever. Brandon Marsh has that type of a mindset as well. Yeah, whatever. Still not super confident in your 10, 9, 8, 76ers, but I am being positive as your good buddy from 2024 years ago. Okay. Uh, when you say uh, buddy Christ, when you say confident, do you mean 
you're not confident that they'll beat the Heat, confident that they'll beat the Knicks. I'm not confident they're making it to the NBA Finals. Like, I still, if you're asking me what happened, how does it end? They get bounced out of the same run of the playoffs against the Celtics. Like, that's what happens. They got to prove to me they could do more than that. It's still, it's still amazing to me. And this, this future conversation that I hope I get to have one day, buddy Christ, I hope you grant me this, this, this one day. I, I want my grandkids to ask me about the process one day. I want, uh, I want my, my grandkids to come up to me and say, uh, um, Hey pops. That's what my kids call my dad, you know, pops, Hey pops. And I'll be like, yes, children. And then they'll be like, oh, tell me about the process. And I'll be like, Oh, the process. What a time. Um, as, as a pops, I'm Ian McClellan. Anyway, uh, I'd be like, oh, Jimmy Butler killed it and they lose to the Celtics, you know. But uh, one story I'll tell is how the Sixers, the year before the process started, got bounced out of the second round of the playoffs with Andre Iguodala and Drew Holiday after a, defying all odds and unfortunate injuries, injuries uh, being bestowed upon the Chicago Bulls. The Sixers beat the Bulls in the first round of those playoffs. Then they went on to get bounced out in the second round in game seven of the Eastern Conference semifinals. And the Sixers, throughout the process, never made it past that point. And in that, they had been bounced out by the Celtics in the in the playoffs in general four times now, three times in the second round. So not a lot changed after dedicating three full years to being terrible. Now eat your spaghetti. That's what I'll say. All right. You're welcome for sp sparing you the pop's voice. Uh, enjoy the week. Enjoy the, the midweek and slay the day today, as the kids say. Slay the day. The day. Oh, yeah, there you go. Thank you, buddy Christ. Hey, slay the day. Okay. You ever hear a new phrase and just be like, no. And you know it's already caught on. Like, you're not going to stop it. Like, slaps. The term slaps. I heard that, and I was like, no. No. <laughs> Rojas is useless. <laughs> Can't even bunt his way on base. RR. That was, hold on a second. That was a great bunt that he laid down. Gomber made a great play. But you're right. There were two close calls. One was on the bunt. The other was on the dribbler to the to short that he couldn't beat out. But don't say, I, I, he's not used as great. He's a great center fielder. Um, but we knew that going into the season. At the plate, eh, he did get a single. He eventually got a single. Or he did get a walk. He got a walk yesterday. He did something yesterday. He got on base. What the hell did he do? I feel like he got a hit. Did he get a hit or was that the day before? No, he was 0 for 2 with a walk. 0 for 2 with a walk. Uh, and he stole the base. So there you go. <laughs> I love the word schmuck. Howie is uh, Sean Kilman. Uh, Howie is a schmuck. That pick is a conditional pick. But once again, Howie is right and everyone is wrong. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Uh, Sean Gillespie, can't speak your mind in the Eagles organization, obviously. When Howie said... Well, we can talk about the inner workings of the organization. And I'm like, isn't that why you're here at a press conference? No, mum is the word at a press conference, Howie. April. Morning, April. Sean, hello again. So glad Devontae is here. Uh, got the seal done. Yeah, so am I. Sean Cody, Slim Reaper, definitely deserved to get paid. Tim M. Might actually be able to draft trot jr in the fourth round wow still excited still excited <laughs> solid killer a great jason seahorn reference not enough jason seahorn references in the world uh who are you taking at 22 if they stay and not trade up for me it's uh cooper de the new jason seahorn who am i taking If they stay at 22, Chop Robinson. I'm going edge. Um, that's who I'm taking. I wouldn't be mad at Cooper DeJean. Since the offseason has progressed, and as it's progressed, James Bradbury has still been here. I am more of the school that James Bradbury isn't going anywhere. They have a lot of young corners. Um. And I, th I think defensively, they still need a lot of help on the on the line. So 
I would go Chop Robinson at that spot. Sean Gillespie, one game against the Heat is scary. Jimmy Butler takes the game to the next level during the playoffs. Sean, I agree. He, you know, I didn't. I know he lost uh, last year in the first game of the play-in tournament. God, I hate the play-in. Hi, you played the whole season to earn the seventh seed. Now go play to earn the seventh seed. Huh? Like, I think there should be special circumstances to why they have to play that game. Like, like baseball, if, they, if you were tied at the end of the year. If they want to make it interesting, if they're within two games, then they play. Stupid. Stupid. I, I, I'm, I know they lost that first game last year in the play-in tournament. Yeah, they lost to the Hawks. And then three days later, they beat the Bulls. What did Jimmy do in that game? Oh, wow. Lowry went off in that game. Lowry had 33 points in that game. This is the first play-in tournament game last year. Uh, Trey Young had 25 points for the Hawks. Jimmy had 21. 0 for 1 from 3, 9 of 11 from the foul line. 21 points, 9 assists. Hero dropped 26. Lowry came off the bench. And hit six of nine from beyond the arc? Holy stromboli. Yeah, it looks like the Hawks pretty much controlled that game. Damn, son. So where was playoff Jimmy in the first round of the play in tournament last year, huh? Eh? Oh, he's scoring 21 points with nine assists. But still, they lost. Jim Dorsey, what's up, man? Game six versus Boston. Harris, Melton, Harden only had 15 total. Uh, points that season they averaged 47 gross thank you jim jim this is a different team with 10 new players and improved coach boston even had two new starters as they had not won a title in 16 years jimmy b has no rings as well jimmy keep talking baby bring me that accuracy <laughs> April, you know me too well. Any Fred Sanford reference? Oh, I'm coming home, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, that's, that'll be me when they ask. Maybe that'll be my if I enter my you know, kid's house and stuff you know, in the future. And uh, when I walk in, maybe I'll have entrance music, and it'll just be the Sanford and some theme, Sanford and, Sanford and Son theme song, which is. I'm going to say the greatest non-lyrical theme song in the history of the planet. Like, if you just play that, everybody knows that. Like, it, it puts a smile on everyone's face. And I think even kids today go, what is that? And be like, oh, that's Sanford and Son. They're like, what is that? It's not a TV show. But they at least know what it is. I told you, coming home from school in April. My mom, mom and pop pops in Baltimore. If I came home from school in the one year I lived with them, uh, we would watch, uh, it was Sanford and Son. That was on after school. I had to read that book. I wish I had duck feet. And then, um, and then, uh, yeah, I watched Sanford and Son. It was great. Yeah. Greg Benson. I love the funky guitar rhythm. That's uh, exactly. <gasps> Ooh, Knight Rider is... Night Rider's pretty good, but I still go. What was that? That's pretty chill. It's pretty good. Mission Impossible is pretty good, but I think if I just walk into a room and I just go, wah, 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 then everyone smiles. It's an instant smile. Night Rider, Mission Impossible. Everyone's like, every everyone goes into the heist version of themselves, <laughs> the criminal version of themselves, kind of. People start talking to a car. You don't need that. Anyway, thanks, everybody, in the chat. You guys are wonderful. As per usual. I'm going to stop pushing buttons here. There we go. Uh, all right. You know the deal for tonight. 6.05 start time for the Phillies and the – in the morning rush. Uh, brought to you by Sky Motor Cars, skymotorcars.com. Phillies and Rockies, the Colorado Rockies, they, they, they cap off their three-game series tonight. 6.05 South Philadelphia. Christopher Sanchez – gets the ball for your Phillies tonight as they try to complete the sweep of the Rockies for their first sweep of the season. 
They enter this game at 10 and 8 on the year. Best start in like forever for the Phils. Rockies are at 4 and 14. Ryan Feltner gets the start. 338 ERA. Right handed pitcher goes against the lefty Christopher Sanchez. Sixers. And Miami Heat tonight, 7 o'clock. Once again, final announcement. I will be on the Locked On Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel right after the game to break it all down for you, so don't uh, miss that. Like, subscribe to the Locked On Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel. Also, like, subscribe to the Jacob Media YouTube channel uh, where you guys can catch me every morning. And, of course, the Farsi Show YouTube channel as well. And guess what, guys? If you like me, if you love me, bonus me today. I'm going to be on with John McMullen. Coming up on Birds 365, hanging out with them for the full two hours today, having ourselves a grand old time. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. My name is Mark Farzad. I'll be back with you guys tonight on the Lockdown Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel, breaking it all down for the Sixers, playing game against the Heat. And then, of course, we'll be back with you guys tomorrow morning as well to break it down even further. Make sure you like, subscribe to all that type jazz, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back with you guys tonight and tomorrow morning and in uh, 40 minutes with John McMullen on uh, Jacob Media. See you guys over there.